the one thing was, does your instructor have a mentor? Does your instructor have someone more knowledgeable, more skilled than they are, that they are unafraid to ask questions to? Welcome to Flying BC, a podcast about the people, planes, and aviation adventures in British Columbia and Canada, with your host, Warwick Patterson. Hey everyone, I hope the start to the new year is going really well. Last week I checked off a big personal bucket list item. If you follow me on Instagram, at Flying British Columbia, you probably saw that I sold my Cessna 172 in November and bought a Mall M4, and I've been working with Ryan at Cardinal Aviation on learning the finer details of tailwheel flying. Well, last week we were going to go up to get some crosswind training in, but the wind just wasn't cooperating. So we went out to the Fraser River, and Ryan passed on some wisdom about how to assess off-airport conditions and make good decisions if I'm going to want to fly to these places, which, inevitably, I do. After a few circuits to a particular gravel bar that I felt was pretty short for my skill level, he said, let's do it. I'll show you that you can do this. And sure enough, once we landed, the gravel bar turned out to be huge and way longer than I needed. And so that was a good lesson in perception from the air. We then went to New Year's Bar, which I'd been to before with Ryan in his plane, and I did my very own first gravel bar landing. So that was a great feeling, but uh, might have been an expensive one. I don't think it was even 24 hours before I'd clicked the order button on the Alaska Bush Wheels website. I still have a lot to learn, but it's going to be a fun spring, I think. Speaking of learning, episode 14 is here, and it's a great conversation about flight instruction with Kimberly Lissick. Kim is a class one instructor, holds an ATPL, and is ICAO certified in advanced flight instruction. As the flying school she worked for pressed pause in 2020, she launched her own online community to help instructors weather the storm and improve their craft. She's a big believer that we need to adapt flight training to take advantage of modern learning science, and that flight instructors can make more money and have more fun by empowering themselves with knowledge beyond just the basics. If you're a flight instructor, this episode is definitely for you. Or if you're a student pilot or a pilot just interested in learning how to make yourself a better pilot, I think you'll find this discussion interesting. So, here we go. Kim Lissick, welcome to the Flying BC podcast. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So first off, I just wanted to get what was the spark that got you into aviation? And, Ooh, let's uh, launch right of... in. Okay, yes. Yeah. Um, to make an extremely long and mostly boring story short, I started in high school. And the the story that I used to tell people when I started in high school is, oh, I love flying. I took my first discovery flight. I fell in love with it. I have to do this for the rest of my life. And the reality of the situation was <laughs> I, I took a discovery flight in high school and then I went to the counseling center at my high school and researched what pilots made. Now, keep in mind, this is 1999. This is a long time ago. So um, the research that I did <laughs> in the career center said that pilots make upwards of $250,000 a year. And so then I thought back to the discovery flight and I thought, well, shit, I can do this. <laughs> the reality of the situation is much, much different. But that's, that's the decision making that went into it. My mother highly encouraged me to do it as well. And in fact, my mom paid for my, my private license in high school, but that's what kicked it all off. <laughs> nice. So you did, uh, you did your PPL in high school. I did. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you got a, an early start, which is great. It was, it was, a, it was an introduction to high intensity learning, doing my grade 12 university exams or entrance exams. Plus my private license at the same time was definitely introduction to high intensity learning. <laughs> yeah. Um, so where did you go after that? Did you go, did you know that you wanted to do it as a job and you kind of continued on that path or did you? Well, I started the private license knowing that I was going to do it as a career. So I immediately applied to, uh, to schools and I chose a school only because I wanted to live in the city. I chose a Southern Interior Flight Center, which was connected to UBC Okanagan um, because I wanted to live in Kelowna. <laughs> I just loved the city. There was zero research put into it. I had zero experience or education on really how to choose a flight school or what makes a good one versus a bad one, um, how you can pick out good instructors versus bad instructors. I just want to live in the city and they had a flight school, so that's where I went. 
so you went through a university program. Tell, tell, take us through to kind of where you are today then, your, your background and your, your aviation journey up to today. <laughs> the aviation journey has been varied. Like I, I said in the beginning that I didn't really get into it because I love flying. Most pilots are just ravenous about it. They're obsessed with it. The pilots love flying. And unfortunately, I'm no longer embarrassed to admit, that's not me. I didn't get into flying because I loved it. I got into it because I have five brothers and a sister, most of whom are mechanics and I'm the youngest and I desperately wanted to be different. The career center said that it paid a lot of money, which I now know it doesn't. And I just wanted to be different and make a bunch of money. As I got into it, as I got into university and I'm starting to experience the world, of course I'm 17, right? Experience the world and, and um, experience the training. I actually hated it. I hated flying. I hated going to the airport. I hated doing weight and balance. I hated everything about it. And because I, I hated the activity so much, I started to really resent my instructors. I started to resent my other students. This is not a fairy tale of the most amazing uh, aviation career ever. Um, but what really made me stick with it is after I graduated from UBC, I have a commercial aviation technology degree which I like to joke is a degree in basket weaving with a major in underwater basket weaving. But, uh, because I know the process and I know the steps now of, of the fastest way to do it with the best education and the least amount of wasted time and wasted money. So I know that process now. And uh, then I got my instructor rating because back in the day, there was actually only two ways to gain hours and everyone needs hours for the experience to get their first job. And I was either head up north and fly for something similar to Buffalo Airways or become an instructor. And I didn't want to leave home or leave the area. So I became an instructor and I first started teaching on Vancouver Island at a little air park called the Courtney Air Park. It's a tiny strip. We did uh, cadet programs. So then air cadets won scholarships to get their power license. And it was a tiny 1700 foot strip where the threshold of 3-1 is the river and the threshold of 1-3 is the ocean and it's tucked beautifully underneath the Comox airspace. <laughs> so you have all of four and a half inches to do your, your circuits round and round and round. It was a really great learning experience, but what I learned from there um, was how to, how to get students through in the least amount of time possible. Because we started with the air cadets. These are kids that show up with glider licenses. They already know how to fly. I thought I was the best instructor in the world because I was getting my students through it 48 hours, 49 hours. Like, why are other schools saying that it takes 65 hours? Look at me doing it in 48 hours. I'm the best. <laughs> <laughs> and then reality hit. <laughs> I was um, headhunted and I went to a private school in Vancouver. It's a little uh, town beside uh, Ladner, it's called Boundary Bay. Um, to find it on any of the Canadian maps is Charlie, Zulu, Bravo, Bravo, tiny little um, area back then. And uh, I realized that I wasn't the most masterful instructor, but what did happen was I started failing. I started failing a lot. And I started uh, getting fired from different positions. So I'm like, well, I'm in a big city now, there's lots of competition, and I got kicked out of teaching ground school, and I got some students taken away from me, and it was a really hard lesson. So then I started actually owning how I present the material and owning my own personal knowledge and actually paying attention to my students. And then I started getting compliments. I remember one, one time I'd worked my way back into teaching private pilot ground school, and I have to say this, that I know that at most flight schools, private pilot ground school to teach it is a punishment. <laughs> However, at the school that I was at, professional VFR, professional IFR, it was a reward. If you were really good, they had a, um, a culture of excellence there that I've modeled ever since in my training. But when I worked my way back into teaching private pilot ground school, I've had more than one student come to me and say, you know what, Kimberly, I've taken this class three times, three times, and I don't get get this one section but the way you explained it tonight it just everything made sense thank you so much i no longer feel like i'm stupid and that that was a turning point for me i have students telling me that i made a huge difference in their lives yep i'm gonna stick with this for sure <laughs> nice um and you've been instructing for 17 years i think you said now um, i have so, yeah so that 
I guess that kind of stuck with you. <laughs> you it, decided that was what you were going to do. It did. And, and not to say that I haven't uh, ventured out. After when I, I did a couple of years at pro, uh, professional VFR, I decided it was time to fly the turbines and, and fly the big airplanes. So I got a job with um, a company in Edmonton that flew Jetstream 31s. And when they, <laughs> let's call it turn the corner, when they went under, then I walked down the street. And that's a fascinating story how I got this job, but it's not maybe for this podcast. <laughs> I, uh, I walked down the street and got a job as first F uh, first officer on the Metro, swearing Gen 4-5. And I did that for a couple of years. And then I just left and I went back to, to teaching. I was uh, chief flight instructor of a flight school way up north in Alberta. I was headhunted and then I was brought down to Calgary to uh, do program development and supervision for Mount Royal University. So I did program development and supervised the instructional staff and I taught there too. And um, just to finish it off, you asked me what, what the process was. So I'll be quick about this. I'm sure people are bored listening to it. But um, I worked for the university and then I, I had a baby. So I went on mat leave. And then after my mat leave, actually during my mat leave, um, I fell bass backwards into sales and appraisals. So while my son was small and I knew I wasn't going to go back into anything for active flying, I um, started uh, selling aircraft and doing appraisals. And I did so many uh, under the tutelage of Mr. Lauren Gray at Aircraft Canada. Delightful man, incredibly knowledgeable. Um, I became a senior turbine appraiser. So an aircraft appraiser with the National Aircraft Appraiser Association, which is the, I was the youngest one in, in AAA history, North American history, which was pretty awesome. And then I decided to venture out on my own. I started my own company and uh, it's it's led up to the last couple of years. So that's the history of everything that I've done so far. Yeah, awesome. It, it's kind of a good example of the different sort of jobs you can have too because I didn't even know an appraiser was an official job you could get. So it kind <laughs> of it makes sense now that you hear it. But Yeah, um, it's typically yeah. a retirement job for most people, like mechanics <laughs> right. and pilots and whatnot. Nobody really goes into it, but... Because I was in a position where someone paid for my paid the ten grand for my training, I decided to do it, and then he kept just giving me all the appraisals, and I became really, really good at it. I've done appraisals for all sorts of cases, but the most notable one that I'm proud of is the BC Supreme Court. I've I've done some appraisals for the uh, some litigation in that one. That was pretty cool. Oh, cool. So now, when we talked before we a couple of days ago, you you made the kind of Offhand remark, but funny remark that flight instruction is broken. <laughs> and um, I wanted to get you to elaborate on that because I think um, a lot of us see flight instruction where, yeah, the, the lowest time pilots are teaching the new pilots and it seems a little backwards. So A little. I will scream <laughs> this from the mountaintops. Yes. And, and it may be funny to most people until you really get into it. I've been doing this for 20 years. Primary flight training all over the world is incredibly backwards. Let's pretend you are going to become a doctor or a lawyer and you're gonna pay $100,000 for your education. If you decide to do that, it's over seven years, you're being taught by the best of the best after a certain amount of what we call in aviation ground school, a certain amount of classroom time and lab experience, experience, then you're put into, as a doctor, you're put into a residency, which means you're trade uh, paid tiny, tiny amounts, but paid to do even more training, right? And you're supervised by the best of the best. Now, in aviation, if you're going to pay $100,000 for an ATPL with a King Air endorsement or any integrated program whatsoever, you are actually taught by the greenest, most inexperienced people in the industry. And it's taught via a game of telephone. <laughs> Have you ever played the game of telephone? Yeah. You sit in a yeah. circle with five people and one person says yellow duck and it comes out the other end. Five people later, very, very differently than yellow duck. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I detest this. Now, looking back over my own personal training and over my career, um, I had a really delightful conversation with a man named John Nyhouse. He is on the board of directors for NAFI, which is the National Association of Flight Instructors down in the States. Um, and they're all over the all over the world, but he, we started talking for 15 minutes because he wanted me to do some content creation for them. And we ended up chatting for two or three hours because we both had the same experience in our training. When I went away to university, I was I was always feeling like I was behind. I told you that I hated it, 
but hindsight is 2020 looking back, I realized that my instructors didn't care. They were there to get their hours and get out. They were treated by the company, and this isn't just the one company, this is all companies that I experienced. They were treated by the company like they were expendable, like they were the lowest on the totem pole, like they didn't matter and that they should just shut up and be appreciative for absolutely anything, okay? So we have this entire cohort of pilots and instructors that are treated like they're absolutely nothing. Now, I've come to learn this is all over the world, but they're treated like they're absolutely nothing and then obviously don't care about their students. So here I was in university. I didn't know anything about anything. I just wanted to get a pilot's license and I'm going through the entire process, years and years of process, thinking that I was stupid, thinking that I was just one of the dumb ones that couldn't pick it up and maybe I should have been a mechanic like my brothers, right? <laughs> Only to like, and then I would compare it with all of my other history. Like, well, I went to national championships and all these sports and I won all of these academic awards in high school before I came to university. Like, I don't understand why I'm suddenly so stupid. But looking back on it now, of course, it wasn't me at all. It wasn't me at all. And um, I, I can't let that happen to anybody else. So because of COVID and all of the awfulness that has happened to our industry in general, um, one of the bright spots that I've come to realize is that it's helped me branch out. Can I, I know this is a little bit of off track. Can I tell you a story about what I did last March? Absolutely. Okay, cool. So COVID closed my, my school down. I was chief of a big school in Edmonton and I'm going to give them props. It's called Synergy Aviation in Edmonton. They started out as a helicopter flight school. They do a whole bunch of pipeline and charter work and they wanted to start a fixed wing flight school. The, the people that started the school are incredibly forward thinking. So they brought me on board to be chief of the fixed wing flight school. They wanted me to design everything. They wanted me to make it the biggest and the best school in the country. And we were all on board. We had the entire team. We had the budget. We had the fleet. It was incredibly exciting. And then COVID shut everything down. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. Well, waiting for it to open back up, I wanted to help flight instructors. So what I ended up doing was just putting out onto my Facebook groups. I said, okay, well, I'm gonna hold a master class for flight instructors, help everybody make it through. For the flight schools that are shut down, everyone's nervous, everyone's stuck. Let's just give, them some, give away some free training and see how people take to it. Now, the first time, I didn't really know, I was hoping for five to 10 people in the class, and I was gonna teach things like leadership and you know sales, because if we come out of this downturn, they're gonna need oh, to that need to know how to sell themselves. We're gonna teach the basics of flight instruction, like how most things that people get wrong, just to help them not only better themselves, get ready for interviews, maybe get ready when the, the industry opens back up. And I was hoping for five to 10 people, I ended up getting 60 applications in a week. And, the se and it went over so well, I guess word got out. The second time I offered it to the same groups with no additional marketing, um, I had 161 applications in two hours. And the, oh, this masterclass was a lot of fun. And I just realized how much I enjoyed doing it. But in the process, you know, we had all of these applications from 13 different countries. And I'm talking to all these flight instructors from all over the world, realizing that the problems that I thought were alone to Canada are actually the same problems that are in primary flight training all over the world. Training hasn't changed since World War II. Very few schools have adapted the learning science that has come out in the last two decades. Very few schools have updated any of their technology or any of their processes. And um, I'm kind of excited in the way that we've decided to proceed forward. Wow, that was way off track, sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. We were gonna get into that anyways. Okay, cool. Um, um, so, but it seems like it's gonna take a pretty monumental shift to change the industry. Because students want the cheapest and fastest, uh, but to retain the experienced instructors, salaries need to go up, support needs to go up. Um, so how do we go about fixing this? It really is. And so it comes back to, sorry, now I'm just remembering the first question you asked flight instructor, uh, instruction is broken. It really is. Um, because the cohort of flight instructors are treated like the bottom of the barrel and therefore they treat themselves like the bottom of the barrel, right? They want to get out of it. They don't take care about their students. So how do we do this? Plus, plus with, I think there's only a handful of countries on the, in the world that actually use a mentorship program like Canada does. In Canada here, 
we we have a mentorship program where you start out as a class four instructor and then you're supervised very heavily or what should be very heavily some schools don't um, by a senior instructor and you work your way up with experience and with tutelage any countries like the faa or countries that follow the faa system they don't you have extensive singular tests before you become an instructor and then you're just released into the wild that's it it's pretty impressive that it's it's kind of the wild wild west over there but how do we make this better how do we get flight instructors to treat themselves better so that you don't have you know the kids coming along who know that we're in an aviation downturn who know that they need an edge over everybody else so they're going to offer to do it for free i'll fly this for free i'll fly that for free which brings the rest of us down and of course we've been fighting this as an industry forever and a day so how do we we fix it and fixing the legislation fixing Transport Canada or the FAA or any of the um, civil aviation authority, the governing bodies is next to impossible. You know, trying to steer that dinosaur is not going to happen. Um, now, fixing the students is is difficult also because they're uneducated going into this, like myself. The amount of people or the amount of research that you can do now that we have the internet <laughs> and Google, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so research is more prolific and reviews of schools are all over the place. So it's, it's getting better to educate the students on what they need to look for. But really, there's an entire skill set and there's an entire missing middle piece. As Simon Sinek says, um, everything breaks in the middle. And that middle piece isn't the bosses and it isn't the clients, it's the instructors. So starting with uh, trying to go to the companies and force force them to pay instructors more is not going to happen because they're going to come back with a very typical, well, you know, they have to earn it and they're, they're not worth it. And this is all my school makes. I can't do it more. Um, and if you, <laughs> uh, go to the instructors who are in those, the same situation say, okay, listen, what about, what if I teach you that you can give a private license, using five tricks, like five, that's it. Give a private license instead of your private students um, getting licensed in se 75 hours, which is roughly the national average. What about if I can teach you how to do it in 60 hours or 55 hours using five tricks? And then what's the first thought that comes into your mind? That if you're a flight instructor and you're getting paid by the hour, and I say yeah, you get your students just, done in less. You just chop 15 hours off my paycheck. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And that's where the thought process dies. So now what about this? Okay, so you get into a student that gets finished in 55 hours, regardless of your boss, regardless of the flight school, or regardless of the regulations. And that student leaves at 55 hours, competent, um, confident pilot. And he goes out and tells his buddies, because pilots hang out with other pilots, man. Pilot students hang out with other pilot students. And the, and the student goes, all right, well, hey, I got my license in 55 hours. I saved myself, what's 15 hours time, like $3,000, right? He's going to tell his buddies. And then suddenly you have more people knocking on your door. Hey, wait a minute. You know, John got his license in 55 hours. Can I train with you? So because we don't have the sales conversation, with instructors, how they can make their own reputation better and how word of mouth works beyond aviation is so small. Like, aviation world is so, that's all we tell people. <laughs> so if we teach the sales, if we teach ownership, if we teach proper leadership, proper communication, you can actually have a position where I call it the tail that wags the dog, right? So if you as a flight instructor, are the most popular one in the company. And you're getting students left, right, and center. Instead of one student at 100 hours, you got two at 50 hours. It's the same amount of hours, but you as an instructor now get more fun. You get two little walking billboards that are out in the world talking about how great you are, right? And so this all hinges on the fact that you have to want to be a good instructor, right? Yeah. I just want to get my hours and get out. Isn't the person who is going to make this change, but... What I've also come in my obsessive study of psychology, especially psychology that's related to uh, student and uh, teacher interactions, um, is that you can help. Nobody wants to do a bad job. Everybody wants to do a good job. They just don't know how. So if you can give them mentorship, but, and I'm going way down into this rabbit hole, sorry. No, that's great. Me mentorship that's digestible, 
then you can show them that they can become a good instructor. And if it's possible, then we're like, they'll try it out. I'm like, okay, I can become a good instructor. I can uh, learn the leadership and communication. I can get my students through at less than the national average. I can make more money. And none of this has anything to do with my boss or the company. Nothing has anything to do with my uh, governing body. This is just me doing an awesome job making more money. Okay? Yeah. Now, yeah, that's great. all of this, I, I do understand that if you go full out for an eight-hour day, you're so exhausted you can't tie your shoes by the end of the day. I get it. There's ways around that too. But to, to wrap up on everything that you asked about your question, flight instructor is broken, how can we um, make this monumental shift? It is by addressing the instructor specifically in a trainable, in a digestible, actionable um, fun and easy way to help the instructors make their jobs easier. And having the, the companies involved, um, giving their instructors some leeway to pursue these things too, I think. Yeah. Um, like if somebody's showing initiative, don't squash it. <laughs> right. And there's some bosses who are just entirely like against initiative. I get it. So I also train, I also teach how to have those conversations with your boss. Let's call it the art of negotiation to get anything you want. <laughs> how do you have the conversation with your boss where you want more money? Well, I can teach you how to have that conversation to get a, a pay raise, to get an upgrade, to get the better airplane. And I teach it every day in, in tiny digestible pieces. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, so you've put a lot of work into your professional development over yes. the years. What was the most valuable to you? You, you mentioned earlier, um, I think you said learning sciences or teaching sciences. And that's a good, uh, like there is a ton to absorb about how to teach and how people learn differently and things like that. So what, what's what been the most valuable for you through your journey? It's in it. Like I said, I'm obsessive about learning the psychology of why people do what they do. Um, but really, <laughs> there's so many different areas. One is a habit and one is a path. So the habit that I got into early that really rocked my world was the habit of doing tiny snippets every day. So I will listen to a TED talk or a podcast or something like Flying BC <laughs> every morning as I get ready. So I get into the habit. It's kind of, excuse the pun, on autopilot. I'm brushing my teeth, I'm doing my hair, I put my makeup on in the morning in the bathroom. And I've got 15 minutes in the bathroom where I have something talking at me. And really what it is, is the best mentorship in the world because I have the best and brightest minds on the planet talking to me every day. I don't have to pay for them except for 15 bucks for the audiobook, right? So um, the my favorite so far, Simon Sinek, and um, mm -hmm. Start With Why, The Infinite Business, anything by Brene Brown, anything by Brene Brown. Um, the Gift of Imperfection, Daring Greatly. I love Jim Quick and all of his books and podcasts on memory and how to learn faster and learn at lightning speeds. I like Tim Ferriss too, because he just jazzes you up about life and what's possible. <laughs> and, and he's one of those, yeah, I listen to him a lot because he's one of those guys who will just dive down the rabbit hole and learn everything there is about something. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to be as crazy as that. You just glean whatever you want out of it. Yeah. Totally. yeah. I like Tony yeah. Robbins um, because he just gives you, jazz you up about what you can do. And so, like the number one thing that I do is just the habit of my own personal development every day. What I can't do, and I know this about myself, some people thrive on this, I can't, is do a weekend seminar. I can't um, drink from the fire hose for three solid days, taking as many notes as I can and digest any of it. Because all I have is I remember the first hour and the last hour, and then I have four notebooks of notes I may or may not ever crack again. Right? May not crack right. open again. I can't do that. So I do my own learning in little bits in the day. And as I've done my research on the science of learning, I've realized that most people are like that too. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That when I was doing my CPL ground school, I was like, okay, I'm going to commit to an hour and a half every morning and just do a little bit every day instead of trying to like do whole days of it when there's yes. business distractions and other things that chop in there. So that See? definitely helped. 
Yes, exactly. And that's when you start seeing actual momentum and actual progress. If you can learn in little bits every day, then you don't ever feel overwhelmed and you're encouraged to go back and do it again. And suddenly three weeks goes by and you've got, you know, 21 days of 15 minutes under your belt. And you're like, oh, okay, it's the equivalent of a university course, right? Now, I said that the number one on my personal development was just the habit of doing that. The, the second one was the, the area that I think best contributed to everything that I've been able to accomplish. Now, when I gave you my history, I stopped pretty much halfway to um, what I've done, but I think sales training, honestly. Uh, Mastering Influence, the course by Tony Robbins, anything by Chris Voss. He's the lead FBI um, hostage negotiator in the States. He's retired, he owns a black swan group now. He wrote a book called Never Split the Difference. And uh, I recently purchased his masterclass on the, the masterclass.com. And anything to do with influence or sales training, really getting people to pay attention to you is the most valuable training that instructors can do. Uh, interesting, yeah. So my my big goal for 2021 as we launch into this new year is I'm finishing my CPL, I'm gonna get my instructor's rating. Um, in your experience and opinion, what makes a great instructor? Um, and how should I approach the process of being a great instructor beyond just the basics of passing my test? Oh, I like that question. It's so varied. It's such an array. But if I had to pick one thing of what to look for in an instructor, someone that you want to work with, um, I could give you a list as long as my arm, but the one thing was, does your instructor have a mentor? Does your instructor have someone more knowledgeable, more skilled than they are, that they are unafraid to ask questions to? Because if that person doesn't have a mentor, the red flags are going up all over the place for me. So most likely if they don't have a mentor, they don't have a group of people where they draw information from or talk about things or discuss things or bounce ideas off, then probably that person will bullshit you at some point, which means that you're asking them a question, they're gonna puff their chest out, and they're going to go, well, yeah, you know, this is, yeah, and then give you some bullshit answer that you then look up and realize is wrong or a little off or whatever it is. But typically people who have nowhere to go, typically new instructors who think they know it all and no longer need to do any more training, um, they will be the ones that aren't personally growing. Right. Right. That's good. That's a good angle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even if they don't have an active mentor, let's pretend when you become an instructor, I can already tell you're going to make an amazing instructor because you're, you're desperately curious about why things happen. Um, let's pretend you don't have someone at the flight school that you work with that is more knowledgeable or even willing to give their time because you learn from other masters, from other greats a little bit every day, you do have a mentor, just not someone that you can bounce ideas off of. You have someone that's smarter than you talking in your ear every day, right? Yeah. And I think that's, um, I think people who are listening to these podcasts and stuff, they're already kind of in that mindset. Like, um, cause my next question was going to be what makes a great student. And I think just <laughs> kind of always having that little trickle of thinking about aviation is a good thing. Um, even if you're not sitting down in a book and learning something, just thinking about aviation all the time and chatting with people, like you say, hangar flying is, is so important. Yeah. Yes. And I find I, I just have one word of warning on that one. If your question was what makes a great student, um, the word of warning is that students often tend to teach each other by consensus. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, if, or even junior instructors or, or people, they sit around in the pilot lounge, they're on the leather couches and they're chatting about some, well, you know, I think it's better to go into the trees and I think it's better to go into the water and you know, what engine failure this. And so they teach by consensus and nobody cracks a book. <laughs> like nobody right. looks at the legislation, nobody looks at the rules. Um, not that there's rules on, on my example of, of, trees versus water in a force landing. But um, a good student, the one trait I've seen in all amazing students is an undying curiosity and, and a willingness to question, even question me. I love it when the students question me because even in the last year, I've learned five things that I've been teaching wrong and it horrifies me, but I, I like <laughs> knowing afterwards that I'm getting better. Um, but if the student has an undying curiosity, that means they will question the authority. They will question the you know, Cody fingers way it's done. I'm teaching you this because that's the way I was taught is 
just sends shivers down my spine. <laughs> like, yeah. There's no reason behind it. It's just the way you were taught and you didn't put any thought process into this whatsoever. <laughs> Um, so, so in regards to like learning sciences and stuff, you said sort of there's been great advances yes. more recently. What, um, just explain some of that a little bit more. Like, what are some of those things that have people have learned about teaching and learning? Well, this would be an entire other hour, but I'm going to pick on the one that I'm most passionate about in injecting into aviation is what we now have the ability for with the technology is a blended learning system. So I know that you have experienced traditional classrooms where you show up, you sit down, you shut up and you take notes and someone lectures at the front of the class and you leave and they were talking so fast, you can't read your notes. You don't really know what's happening. So you have to dive in the textbook and teach yourself anyways. And it goes from a one hour lecture to the cliche that for every hour you spend in the classroom, you sh should be spending three to five hours studying. That is garbage. <laughs> and it's garbage because that is the system that we are accustomed to. Now, I also know that you personally have experienced an online type ground school, right? Yeah. Where you have all the slides available to you and either there's a video or an audio recording or maybe none, and then an online quiz, and then there's no human interaction, but you have all the information and you have the ability to hit rewind, right? So if you're talking, there's no such thing as an online instructor talking too fast because you can just backspace, backspace, you know, hit the back button. But the problem with model number one is that it can be lacking in interaction, but most likely not. Um, the problem with model one is that it's just drinking from a firehouse and there's no rewind button. And the problem with model number two is that there's no human interaction and there's no variation. And often if you're confused, you're then heading over to YouTube to find <laughs> the latest person who will explain it in a different way. And you're still teaching yourself. And I, I find this terrible, but the actual, the science of the blended learning system says that if you give the students the knowledge um, first in the ground school, you can have the slides, you can have the person talking on video, you can have the quiz, that's just knowledge, that's not a competency. You can't learn to ride a bike by watching a slideshow. But then you take that knowledge of where the pedals are and how to get on the front and, you know, tire pressure, and you come into the classroom for only the exercise portion. So you're expected with a high level of responsibility to learn the knowledge, but then bring that knowledge with you, bring all the puzzle pieces with you to have the instructor only go through the exercise and not the lecture, then that is the fastest way that people can use any kind of learning management system. It's called blended. So the online portion for knowledge and the in-person for only the exercises and not a lecture. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause they say, um, yeah, the, the cockpit is the worst classroom because it's oh, noisy, it's loud, never. there's 500 things going on. <laughs> so yeah, but if but if you use it to prove what you've learned outside of the cockpit, then yeah, it's a great way to do it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so just to just to hammer home my point, if you're okay with this, yeah. is that if you're learning a private license and you get all of the knowledge at your fingertips and present it in such a, a way that you can retain it as best as possible, but then immediately show up and the instructor doesn't lecture at the front of the classroom. They don't stand there and, and recover the information you've already covered, but simply dive into say a case study or a navigational planning exercise or a bridge, that's a chemism, I'll explain in a second, or a bridge, or um, just an activity of some sort, then use the knowledge, it turns into a competency. There's knowledge all over the internet. You could have anything you want at your fingertips, but what we as pilots need to do is learn a skill take the knowledge, turn it into a skill. So now our instructors are no longer being punished by teaching private pilot ground schools because they have to lecture for three hours and exhaust themselves and deal with eight different learning styles in the classroom. But what if that instructor were to show up to do only the fun stuff, navigational exercises, planning, instead of teaching what the squares are in a weight and balance sheet, they show up with a set of scales, right? And away everybody in the classroom and get people moving and laughing and thinking. That is the beauty of a blended learning system. Nice. Um, did you have you learned anything along the way about sort of the behavioral differences in students and how, um, like people learn differently, or or you have some students who are very A type personalities and they like to know everything right off the bat. Um, I guess that's probably an evolving thing. As you instruct more, you learn to deal with those things. But is there any tools that you've come across to help 
build those skills? Oh, yes, absolutely. Now, there are, to keep in mind that when you get to your instructor rating, there's an entire section of your training dedicated to handling different student personalities, okay? In the FA uh, Flight Training Manual, um, there is, I think, six chapters dedicated to different student personalities. But if I were to boil it down to the easiest possible thing for anybody to understand, it's two major categories. Um, the first is andragogy versus pedagogy. So pedagogy is how children learn. Children are entirely dependent on the instructor. Now they stop being entirely dependent on the instructor, you know, mid-teens, but they're still forced into that system where you sit down, you shut up, you listen to your instructor, do what you're told. There is zero free thought in that whatsoever besides picking the title of your book report, right? There's yeah. zero thinking skills and problem solving and critical thinking skills. And so they're forced into that system when they come out of the high school and university type system where that's where how they're forced to learn. They don't know how to learn any other way. So that's pedagogy. And andragogy is the science of how adults learn. Now, adults want to be in control, right? So if you and I were in the same room and I said, okay, so today I'm going to teach you how to rewire your kitchen, read the six manuals. I think, I'm hoping, <laughs> if you're honest with yourself, the first question is, why do I need to know that? Like, why are we doing this? Why are you forcing me to waste my Saturday to do this? This is BS, right? So adults need to be in control of their own learning. There has to be a strong motivation for reading the textbook, a strong motivation for learning the technique and the skill and the exercise. And they also have to feel like they're in control of the pace. Because if you and I are, are working together and I'm trying to teach you how to rewire your kitchen and I'm going through the steps far too fast, you're going to get frustrated. Like, Kimberly's a terrible instructor. She's not paying attention to me and this is going too fast, right? Whereas a child in that environment is expected to keep up and in fact, they're punished if they're not. So there's two very different ways that people learn. And so understanding that as a flight instructor, you're almost always dealing with adults. Now, this is the second category that I was talking about. You're almost always dealing with adults, but half of the adults you're dealing with are fresh out of high school and university and have not been taught how to take personal responsibility over their own training, right? Mm -hmm. So then people get frustrated with quotey fingers, the millennials. <laughs> And it's, it's, in my mind, it's complete bullshit because those, those kids, those people, they want to do well. They want to, to learn it really well, but they don't know how to learn it very well. And therefore the instructors get frustrated on them. They think they're, they're stupid or they call them entitled. And it's just this battle. It's this power struggle the entire time that can be entirely wiped away with one tiny mindset shift. And so then on the opposite, the far extreme of that, then we have much older adults. So these are the people who are gonna come into their training um, being very, very, very far removed from their initial primary training. So they've been very comfortable in their own um, environments for a very long time and they think they can't learn. I'm too old, I can't learn. I'm too old, I'm really slow. I'm too old, right? And I remember a conversation that I had with one of these lovely gentlemen. I was teaching at Pro VFR in Boundary Bay and his company had sent him, he's a helicopter pilot, helicopter pilot for 30 years, just the most amazing man. And his company was changing their SOPs where all of their senior helicopter pilots had to get an IFR rating onto their helicopter license. And he was never gonna use it, but because of the company regulations, he had to get it. So he came in, the man is, oh God, he must've been 60. And I was 23 at the time, so there's a big <laughs> difference, right? So I remember sitting down in the room with him. He'd gone over the, the, I think it was, I don't know, a VOR lesson for the third time. He was feeling very defeated. And I was having my lunch, just sitting there with him because I wanted to get to know him. It was pretty cool. I'm the youngest of, of six kids. I know how to talk to somebody that's older than me and stay interested, right? Um, so he said, you know, I just, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I can get it. I'm going to have to quit. And that broke my heart. And I said, what? No, IFR is so easy. You haven't, you don't understand how easy this is. IFR is super. But instead of just droning on about how easy it was and making you feel dumber, here's what I said. I said, well, I've had the opportunity to teach my dad how to fly. And that was a fascinating opportunity. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I don't recommend it. If you never want to teach your kids how to drive a car, don't let your kids teach you how to fly a plane. <laughs> Anyways, and I said, what, what I found with my dad is that he wasn't stupid. In fact, he was one of the most bright and brilliant people I've ever met. 
he could pick up on things in his um, in construction, because he did construction his whole life, you know, with saws and wood and cuts and angles and all this stuff. He could pick up on any new stuff immediately because he was comfortable in that environment. I said, he actually learns really, really quickly when he feels comfortable. Um, but when I taught him how to fly, he was in an environment he was very uncomfortable. And therefore, he had to stop and take in the information, digest it. And in a lot of cases, he had to throw out some information, like throw away some information they already thought about how the world worked so he could take in the new information. You can't pour more water into a full cup. So he had to empty the cup a little bit and so to take in the uh, new information. I said he learned very, very quickly, but only after he became okay with being uncomfortable. You know, he spent 40 years in his in his career being the best at what he did. He spent 40 years knowing exactly what to do at all times. There was no discomfort in that whatsoever. But now flying, everything's new. It's uncomfortable. He has to slow down the way he used to learn and now he feels stupid because he's got to slow down from the way he used to learn. And I said, the reason that kids are always thought of as being sponges are learning very, very quickly because they've been uncomfortable their whole lives. They don't know any different. <laughs> learning something new, this is just the process. And so I, I guess, he took that to heart, and when he finished his, his IFR rating, he did finish, and somebody else from his company two months later tracked me down, and they said, are you Kimberly? I said, yeah. Or I, he said, Kim, I introduced myself as Kimberly all the time. He said, are you Kim? I'm like, yeah. He goes, you know, John told me to come some see you. Apparently you give great pep talks. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so to bring it all back, um, to help somebody learn to deal with the major personality differences, the first thing you have to think of is, is what are they most comfortable with? Are they, are they kids fresh at a school where they don't know how to take responsibility for their own learning? Or are they an adult where they want to take responsibility for their own learning? And if you get into the adult mentality, are they the kind of adult that is that thinks they can't do it because they're too old, when really it's just being uncomfortable with the learning? Or are they the really, really young adult who needs a heck of a lot more <laughs> guidance and less motivation and the older adults need more motivation and less guidance. Right. Yeah. Cool. So we touched on it a little bit earlier, but you started a company in March, oh. um, advancing aviation yes. with these online, online like master classes online. Um, so tell us a little bit more about that because now you've got sort of a, a monthly subscription system, a Facebook group. Uh, I just recently joined it. I'm going to start tapping into it. And... <laughs> Yes, um, I saw that. So, that was really great. <laughs> so, so was was that a COVID uh, response to COVID, or was it? Um... That was a complete COVID ad adaptation, absolutely. And even though I cut off my my chat in the beginning about how this evolved, it did start with free master classes. Realizing that people did want the mentorship, and then the feedback that I got from those classes was that they wanted more, but they couldn't do two hours. I can't take two hours of my day to do this. Can we, can we chop it down? Can I get a recording? Can I get more? Can I get it all the time? And the light bulb just went on. Like this is exactly what I was attempting to do with the school, but I can do it online now. It's a COVID adaptation. And one of the beautiful things that happened that May, um, I guess I didn't tell you this, but a couple years back, I had the great opportunity through Synergy Aviation. They paid for me to go to the JAA Training Center of Excellence in Amsterdam. And so to, um, I became certified by ICAO itself um, in advanced aviation instruction and aviation training management. And I was taught, so lucky, you know, in the rotating list of instructors, my instructor for this program was the founder of Global Aviation Training. I can't, you can't get more lucky than that. Mustafa Homendi, he, he's the founder of GAT, which is an arm of ICAO dedicated to standardizing training all over the globe. And so Mustafa was my instructor and I'd like to brag for just a moment, if you're okay, because I'm very proud of this. Absolutely. <laughs> that of the weeks that I spent in Amsterdam doing this training on the very second day, Mustafa pulled me off to the side and he suggested that I apply to ICAO to teach the course I was taking. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty big ego boost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so in COVID 2020 May, he contacted me and asked me to be part of his first class on virtual classroom instructor. 
So I did, I participated. I had to wake up at two o'clock in the morning to do this online because he was teaching from Morocco. And I became certified via ICAO for virtual classroom instructor. And it was very, very generic training. So what I did is I took the um, training on how to be an engaging presenter online to overcome the obstacles that are, there are many overcoming obstacles of teaching online and apply it to my passion of helping flight instructors in such a way that is digestible and it's actionable and it's fun. And so Advancing Aviation was born. I um, had turned it into a Facebook group. It's a private mentoring group that I'm sure there's going to be many more pop up like it immediately because people have given me praise and a couple of ex-business partners are probably going to try to rip it off. But um, it's a private Facebook group that requires a subscription. And so you've got half Facebook group and half back office on the website of training. In the group, I go live almost every day for 15 to 20 minutes on training that instructors need that they don't normally get. Um, I don't teach how to do a pre-flight inspection because instructors don't need that. What instructors need is the five minute cartoon on how to understand or deliver the pedostatic system so the students never forget. We don't need to see the accordion aneroid barometer inside the altimeter. We need the trick on how to never forget it. Um, the instructors, I, I teach on communication, which I know is a very ambiguous and lofty word, but really, if I were to boil it down, it's how to talk to somebody so they like you. Bosses, yeah. colleagues, how to do an interview properly, right? How to not piss people off at work, how to, um, the little ways that you are actually alienating your students that nobody talks about. Um, so that's the communication portion of it. Leadership is, as I already discussed, how to have the tail wag the dog, how to become the most influential person in your flight school so that you can get the pay raises, how to um, network so that if you desperately want a new job or you want the better air, airplane, networking is a fundamental key, especially in an aviation downturn that you need to become good at right away. That's not a ground school class, right? Right. Um, I also give how to master, teach your students how to master the forced landing in two flights. You know, everybody's had that, that student that just can't get forced landings, just can't get their landings. They've spent 20 hours and 15 hours and 10 hours in the target, and that should never, ever happen. So I can tell you in 20 minutes the, the five things you need to do to get your students to master force landings in two flights. And I have had feedback from my instructors online. I've never showed up. I've never flown with their, their students. I've had instructors over and over and over again tell me that it's worked. Your, your, your tips work. Your tricks work. The, the list works. The checklist works. And I don't ever have to be with you. So that's what I love about this. And right now in the group, we have 58 people from nine different countries. And it's growing. Obviously, I want to affect more and more. So I have a contract with uh, or uh, an agreement with NAFI, National Association of Flight Instructors in the States. And I'm working on the um, Big Flight Instructor Association in Australia and New Zealand just to get this information out there. Help instructors have more confidence. Help instructors teach faster and have more fun. Help instructors get the job before the experienced pilot. Like, if you have... 3,000 hours and the instructor has 3,000 hours. Our industry thinks that the bush pilot's going to get the job, but I can teach the instructor how to handle that interview and get the job first, right? right. So the stuff that you don't normally get in ground school. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're just coming up to an hour, so I think <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it there. I think there's we can go so many different rabbit holes there, but yes. um, where can people find you online if they want to check out what you're doing? Okay, um, entrance into the group is typically one-on-one, -on -one, so you can find me on Facebook, Kimberly Dawn. Um, you can find me through Instagram, too. I'm putting, trying to put more effort into that one. It's I know Kimberly. That's my little at, I know Kimberly. So you can find me through Instagram, Kimberly Dawn and Facebook. You can send me an email at kim at advancingaviation.com. Um, I guess I didn't really go through my, my full list of credentials, but I am a Canadian class one instructor, which means I can teach instructor ratings and, um, uh, I can only teach Canadian instructor ratings, although I am working on my, uh, instructor rating in the States as well. So that's pretty much the best way to get a hold of me. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, now everybody's homework is to go and learn <laughs> learn more about what they <laughs> what they don't know if, and if they, how to become a better instructor. And, yeah, if yeah. they want to search the the private Facebook group, it's called Top Instructors and Students. So it's not just for flight instructors, um, students who maybe don't have a flight instructor that dedicates themselves to personal development. Um, then the students can come into the group too, and I teach to absolutely everybody. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me today. And um, I think, I, well, as I go on my journey to be an instructor, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of good info to chew on and try and make myself the best instructor I can be and, and teach teach people to be aviators, not just pilots. Yes, so. but you can do it in less hours and you can actually have fun. If that's the one message I could broadcast to everybody, you can do it in less hours and actually have fun. <laughs> Thanks to Kim for coming on the show. I'd love to hear from you, the listeners. Did any questions pop up while listening? Or do you have something to add? I'll be circling back to the guests on the shows to do a monthly Q&A session. So if you thought of a question you'd like to ask Kim, send me an email, podcast at flyingbc.com. Or message me on Instagram at Flying British Columbia. Let's keep the discussion going. And the new Flying BC flight suit patches have just arrived. There are two ways to get one. When you become a Patreon supporter, you receive a patch and a bunch of bonuses. Or, for a limited time, you can leave a written review on Apple Podcasts. I'll pick a reviewer each show and send a patch to them. If you'd like to get in on the Patreon program, head to patreon.com slash flyingbc. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thanks for listening, and now you've got control.